Dorkening and all affiliated shows are not intended for anyone under the age of 18. The following may contain discussions or scenes that have adult situations, graphic violence, nudity, strong sexual content, and graphic language. This show is intended for mature audiences only. Viewer discretion is advised. I saw you grooving there, Tony. <laughs> we are now live for another episode of the Wicked Horror Show. And uh, with us today, we have Kevin. I didn't get to see Tony grooving. You should get that on tape sometime. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he's taped us before. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm 100% sure he has. Yeah. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Yo, yo's here. Uh, Tony. What is going on, people? Tony, would you like to introduce our awesome guest? I will. Uh, we have Miles Dolak on today. Hopefully I said that right. Uh, writer, director, and actor in the movie Dinner Party. How are you? I'm well, guys. How are you? Pretty Doing good. Well. So well, did he pronounce your name correctly? Pretty close. Doliak. Ah, Doliak. Ah, okay, there is that. Okay, I apologize. I'll, I'll take it. Yeah, it's better than nothing. Thank you, Thank you guys, by the way, for the disclaimer at the top of the show. Oh, I come up these things. I, I never know. Can you swear? What, oh, yeah. what goes on on these shows? I don't know. What what's so? Thank you for the disclaimer. Yeah, there's, right. a, there's, there's a very good chance we're going to say horrible things. So okay, um, okay, like okay. swears. So so Let's yeah, yeah. Tony, do you want to uh, to you know start off the conversation about the movie? Uh, sure. I um I first saw a trailer for it. Um, and it's I. Actually, let me let me plug it now. There is a physical copy of the movie, so I did watch it. Um, I saw it, it's put out by Gravitas Ventures, and um, it fell when I saw the trailer. I'm like, this has pretty much everything I want in it. It it had, you know, um, well, I'm sure uh, we'll play the trailer, uh, but it looked like it went, you know, down the rabbit hole that I always like. Like I don't want to say satanic. Uh, like rituals and stuff, but right when I saw the trailer, I'm like, I gotta, you know, sit down and watch this movie. So, um, what? Because you wrote this movie, uh, where did you get the, you know, idea for it? Um, well, I, I have to correct you, Tony. It's uh, the film's distributed by Uncorked Entertainment, and Keith, right. Leopard, Keith Leopard at Uncorked would be very pissed off at me if I let Gravitas Ventures slide. So, anyway, thank you. Thank you, Keith, or you're welcome, Keith, whatever. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I co-wrote this film with Michael Donovan Horn, and uh, it's actually the first feature I've ever directed that I didn't build from the ground up. And so that was kind of an exciting experience because uh, the script came to me uh, via one of our producers, uh, Jim Boolean, who had been working with Michael and developing the script. And the script came to me, and I thought the bones were really good. I thought it had a lot of interesting angles going, uh, a lot of fascinating psychoanalytical rabbit holes about how uh, people who have suffered abuse oftentimes compartmentalize that abuse and then channel it in twisted ways and, and, and become abusive themselves. Um, but I thought it needed some narrative cohesion. And uh, so I, I asked Michael, I said, look, look, the script has some interesting characters. It's got a good foundation, but I, I really think we can take it to the next level. So let me, let me come on, let me write this thing with you and get it where I feel like it needs to be uh, for production. And so the, the thing that really became the axial point of the whole script was the character of Sadie, who wasn't originally in the script, um, which is very hard for me to even conceive of now. And um, so, so I wrote the character of Sadie, and and Michael and I went back and forth a bit, and and you know, 
ancient religion and, and the occult, these sorts of things have always been a deep fascination for me. So anytime I get to play in that sandbox, I am a, an extremely elated writer, filmmaker indeed. So um, that was that was sort of there when the first draft of the script came to me, but we really took it sort of next level uh, once I got my hands on it. And um, ultimately I'm, I'm really pleased with how it turned out. Nice. Yeah, I, I uh, like I, I didn't know much going into it. I didn't even watch the trailer. I just I was like, I don't even want to see the trailer. I just want to watch the movie. And, you know, like at a time like like now, it's good to kind of escape, you know, and mm -hmm. this 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 definitely was I was able to do that. It, it actually it almost felt like a play to me. Yeah. Like, I, I think that it, I think it could it could actually with a few twists or a few little changes, it could be a play. Um, is that anything that you've ever thought of doing? I, I mean, I don't know if you if you uh, if you actually act in theater as well, but like, w was there anything about like the writing process for this that maybe led you that direction? I, I certainly do act in theater, Kevin. Thank you for that question. Um, and you're not the first person to say that, and, and I take that as a compliment because um, some of my literary heroes are absolutely playwrights: Tennessee Williams, Eugene O'Neill. Arthur Miller, uh, August Wilson. And um, when I'm writing something, I am most concerned with who the characters are and where they've been and where they're going and sort of plumbing the depths of their psyche and taking uh, my time to, to get to know these people and get to know these relationships. And... Um, Story, of course, is paramount, but character is a really close second, you know, by the sort of razor's edge. Um, and so I, I spend a lot of time thinking about character, and I spend a lot of time thinking about character relationships. And I really, uh, I really love the character relationships in this movie and the, the banter between the characters and the, the histories that that you don't really get to see, but you know just by the way these characters interact with each other. So, so absolutely, I, I, I think about the theater. I come from the theater. That's, that's really how I got my start. Um, and, you know, I, th they're doing this, right? They're like in, in Scotland and Ireland and places, right? Like Reservoir Dogs is on the stage. Hmm. Um, and I find that utterly fascinating. So I absolutely do think about uh, the sort of theatricality of the piece uh, as I'm writing. I really, I really do think it could play well on on stage. Like it was something where, um, you know, it, it was powerful enough as it is. But on stage, I think it would be even more powerful because it, you know when you're in the room and it's right. just, you know. But it's uh, so maybe when things get back to normal, who knows? Maybe it's something that you can uh, work into a, like a stage show and, you know. Well, one of the things that was attractive to me about the script to begin with is it, it effectively takes place in one location. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, foundational for a, a, a play, right? You know, something that like a 12 Angry Men or something that happens in one room effectively. And this is more than one room, but it's it's one house. Yeah. Um, and as an independent filmmaker, you're always looking for ways to make a quality film as cheaply as you possibly can. And one of the ways you do that is limit locations. So yeah. um, when, the, when the script first came to me and I said, okay, this is all taking place in one house, uh, that was really something that drew me to the project and said, okay, we can capitalize on this and we can take advantage of this. And yeah. you know, the same would be true of a play. Oh, totally. And then, you know, considering that you only used one location, you, you went with a hell of a house. Like it's, it's yeah. a really nice house. Like it was, uh, so I'm sure, I'm sure it wasn't like on the cheap, but it was, uh, you know, a very, very, uh, you know, like it was, it was almost a character in itself too, you know, like, uh, looking at like they opened up the, she opened up the cabinet and it opened up the way it did. I'm like, I've never seen that before in my life. Like, <laughs> I want to find a house that does that. I want to just hide in there or something. I don't know. Um, so yeah, just the, the house itself is is almost a, a character. I mean, in, in a really kind of like lets you see them that the main characters are almost out of their element a little bit, you know, much too because it's like obviously this is not their norm, you know. But the you know, the other people, this is like everyday thing for them. Yeah, well, one of the things that scared the shit out of me about this project was, 
okay, it's one location, but the location has to be this incredible thing, right? This house has to be really, really special. And where are we going to find some rich people who are going to let us, you know, splatter blood all over their walls and tear their house up and not tear their house up. Yeah. We leave everything exactly the way we find it. Of course. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, the, you, you get my meaning. Yeah. Um, and we were in fact fortunate to find uh, uh, cardiothoracic surgeon, Carl McLean and his uh, incredible wife, Pam McLean, who allowed us into their house. And we basically took over. I mean, they, they moved out for three weeks and, and we had uh, free reign of the place. And the, you're absolutely right. The house had to be a character in and of itself. And um, kudos to my uh, art department, to my production designer, Julie Tosh, and um and her team georgia robles uh who who created a lot of the art the faux jackson pollock painting and uh the art in in the altar room uh they just did an absolutely fantastic job and then the costumes uh were designed by lindsay uh lindsay ann williams my partner in life and art and and all kinds of shenanigans uh, who also was a producer on the film and played sadie so uh, the, the whole design of the film, and that, and that really began with the house. It began with finding the right location and then bringing our team in and letting them put all the, the finishing touches on it. There's yeah. a, a Wandy Wilson. Um, so, yeah, the house was absolutely critical, and we were, we were very fortunate to find the right house in that Yeah. Place. Yeah, yeah. If, if the like the the costuming and stuff like that, if if that wasn't a different kind of house, it wouldn't have fit at all. It would have right. to go to something else. I mean, it really added to the character, but the character that, in general, yeah. But go ahead. Yeah, was yeah. that why um, the character was a surgeon? Uh, no, he was always a surgeon. Um, uh, but it, uh, you know, it's gotta work out got, that way. When we got Doctor McLean's house, he was like, "Well, could you make him a heart surgeon?" So we have a little bit with a heart. That's sort of an homage to Dr. McLean. Uh, but yeah, he was always a surgeon. All right. I got a little something on your face, Dan. Um, so yeah, the the, uh, the cast in general, like uh, I know, uh, y y like you said, uh, your your partner in life and, and everything you do is in the movie and yourself, is, you know, you're in the movie as well. Do you want to talk a little bit more about the uh, the rest of the cast? Absolutely. Uh, you know, the, the folks sitting around that table, it was, I knew it was absolutely imperative that they have a certain esprit de corps, a camaraderie, um, a, a chemistry that was really going to make this thing uh, click, that was really going to make it move. And, um, and the, I, I think the intimacy that, that this cast had, and we all genuinely liked each other. We hung out outside of shooting. Um, was really absolutely critical to the success of the film. And um, Bill Sage in, in this film, who is just a consummate pro and you've seen him in so many things, um, you know, we are what we are and, and, and power and uh, happen Leonard and, and all the way back to American psycho. Um, and my old buddy, Mike Mayhall, frequent collaborator, Mike Mayhall, who also served as the stunt coordinator on this film in the role of Jeff. Um, Camille McEwen, uh, Lindsay, I've already mentioned. Um, um, who am I missing? Allie Hart, right? Yes. Allie Hart. Who, um, we were we were trying to get Bill Sage in the movie, uh, who is rep by Rachel Sheedy um, of Insurgent Entertainment, and I, I had sent the script to Rachel and. She said, you know, you, I, I have somebody, if you don't have somebody for the role of Haley, uh, you have to look at Allie Hart. She's absolutely fantastic. She's going to be huge. Just, just read her for it. And, um, and we did, and we were all blown away. And she, she really is the heart and soul of the movie. And um, I, I just, I can't say how, how much she, she brought to the table. And she's so sexy and weird and vulnerable and uh she, she reminds me of like a, a sort of a young female james dean she has all these fascinating quirks and the way she holds her lip and does all these little things um so she would we knew we had to have somebody in that role who could embody a lot of different things um 
and then finally, Sawandi Wilson, who plays the role of Sebastian, uh, just sent in a cold audition on Actors Access hmm. uh, of hundreds and hundreds of auditions for that role. There he is. And um, and we were like, this is our guy. He's our he's sort of our, uh, you know, God of mischief. He's our he's our Loki. He's our uh, he's our Hermes, you know, just, you know, flitting around, causing trouble and, and stirring the pot. Um, uh, and we knew we had to have an incredibly magnetic, uh, actor in that role and, and, and someone who could also be funny, um, and whimsical and, and, and I mean, that's the thing about these characters is there's, uh, they, they go a lot of different places and, um, the actors had to be willing to, to sort of just let it fly and, and be flexible and, and potentially fall flat on their faces and um, do something that was absolutely terrible to get to the place where ultimately we, we wanted them to be. And, and they were all game and they were all wonderful. And I couldn't be more pleased with this cast. Nice. Yeah, it was definitely, uh, I mean, each character had their own, like, I don't want to say quarks, but their own like essence around them. And then right. you mentioned, you know, he was the uh, comic relief because there's a lot of scenes in this. I'm like, well, this is getting crazy. And then, you know, a little comedy was sprinkled in there. Not, you know, right. nothing crazy, but it was just like, okay, I think I needed that a little bit because there were some scenes I was like, wow, okay, this is like very intense. So I like how you sprinkle the stuff in there. Hmm. Well, the film, I mean, the film certainly has an element of satire to it. And and it it also has that element of theatricality to it, uh, which Kevin referred to. Um, and I mean, satire has to have humor. It has to have humor. There's Bill Sage, um, and so that was very important to us that it didn't just that it didn't just hang in this sort of dark, heavy place, but it it had elements of lightness and elements of humor that sort of allowed the audience to take a breath and to you know chuckle a little bit and to uh, you know, uh, sort of gather their composure before we throw them back down this, you know, into this horrific tunnel of madness and yeah, whatever, you know. Yeah, they were great. And, and I'm glad that you mentioned that Bill Sage was in Happen Leonard because I was like, why do I know this guy? How do I yeah. know? And I didn't bother to look on IMDb because I'm, you know, busy with everything else. And yeah. but I loved Happen Leonard. So I'm going to have to go back and watch that again, too, because I'm just like, what? When you said that, I was like, oh, I love that show. And then also too, looking at looking at your IMDb. I mean, obviously, you know, we've talked to you before, but you know, you were you were on The Purge, which is a show that I loved, and it, it didn't get picked up again. But uh, but still, that's that's cool that you're you're able to do these kind of things as well. And before everything happened, were you um like like uh, constantly in the theater, or was it something that uh, you were focusing more on film? Or well, but I mean, I I was I've been doing theater all my life, and and you know, before this was. Uh, going on, you know, uh, Lindsay and I, we were, we had been running a theater company in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, where we lived uh, prior to moving back to the greater New Orleans area. I'm now teaching film at Loyola University in New Orleans. Um, and then I was, you know, I, I had a good year last year. I did a lot of really cool projects, including The Purge and including Watchmen, which was a mm -hmm. you know, huge show. And I would just, humbled and honored beyond belief to have been a part of it. Lovecraft Country, uh, which is uh, about to hit the Jordan Peele, Misha Green, J.J. Abrams produced um, show. Um, so, yeah, I was I was keeping pretty busy. I, I kind of felt, I mean, as an actor, you're always, uh, you, you got to relish the job you're, you're doing at the moment because you never know when the next one is coming down the pipe. Mm. Um, but I was I was on a bit of a roll there, at least I felt. And then, you know, and then with di dinner party coming out and, and completing post-production on that. And and then, of course, uh, the world shut down. So uh, here we are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and looking and, forward to getting back to something like normal. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the thing is it's, uh, you know, the, I think a lot of the artists are like hit like pretty bad with this whole thing. You know, there's a lot of like actors, actresses, stand-up comics, musicians that they make their living performing. And it's just, it's tough to do right now. Like there's, uh, there are some productions that are, that are happening. Um, I don't know how they're happening, but they are. 
And um, so at least we'll have some stuff coming out. But, you know, at, at some point we're going to run out of material. We want new stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, uh, you know, I, it's, it's, it's a huge conundrum right now, right? Because if you can get content out there, I mean, there's going to be a rush on content next year. Mm. At yeah. some point, right. Everyone has watched all of Ozark and all of, <laughs> I don't know, Hannibal yeah. on, on Netflix. Now it's on Netflix. Uh, and, uh, the, you know, all the Marvel films again and, and everything that's on Disney plus and, you know, Hamilton and the Mandalorian and whatever. And they're out, they're out of stuff to watch. Mm -hmm. And, um, and in some ways, I think that helped the dinner party. Um, because uh, the dinner party seems to have bigger visibility than anything that I've done at, at this point. It's really? my, my fifth feature. And just looking at the number of critics with eyes on it, um, the, you know, the traffic on, on the web and, and various sites and what, how many people are watching the trailer, how many people are reviewing it on IMDb and all those, these kinds of things. And I think it's just a matter of the fact that uh, COVID, as terrible as it has been, um, has leveled the playing field to some degree in the in the film world. Yeah. Because nobody's really getting a theatrical release, right? The, whether you're a studio film or whether you're an independent film, you're going straight to the streaming platform. Um. And everybody's kind of on the same page. Uh, and that's been a very interesting dynamic for me, watching the dinner party make its way into the world um, and effectively have the same kind of traction, at least with critics and audiences, that a major studio film would have. Now, we don't have the marketing dollars that they have to get it in everybody's face all the time. Um, but it, it really has been interesting to me that, that, you know, what the pandemic has done is it's taken that, that thing that the studios are able to sort of lord over independent films, the like 300 city theatrical release or whatever, mm -hmm. that's, go that's gone. Yeah. So now it's just everybody's in the streaming world and what are you going to watch? Right. We're, we're, we're right there with, with, right. with the big guys. And th that's the one thing that we bring up a lot too. Like, you know, we all love the big Hollywood blockbusters. They're fun. Like they're a really good time. Yeah. But I personally feel that the most, more of the creativity is coming with the lower budget and independent stuff. Cause they, they need to be more creative. Like, right. you know, and, and you know, cause they don't have the giant budgets. They just do whatever they want. So that's where a lot of the originality, like, cause Hollywood just does the same stuff over and over again. I mean, well, you can, you can group. I, I was going to say is uh, we, we also need to play the trailer here, but uh, it's also less oversight. You know, how many times, you know, are you waiting for this awesome movie? Perfect example, um, Justice League. Mm -hmm. And it gets released. And then, you know, a couple of years later, we're getting a totally different one because there was too much oversight on the first one. Yeah. Yeah. It's no doubt. Indie is where it's at. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. That's where all the heart is. Those are people. Those are people that are making movies because they want to make movies and they want to create art. And the other ones are just like, I really want to just buy a new house. Like, that's that's. Why yeah. some other people are doing it? You're not everyone, but there's there's a good amount. Well, we're make. I would take it a step further, Kevin, and say we we're making movies. Independent filmmakers are making movies because we have to make movies. Mm -hmm. But I, I feel like I have to make movies to stay alive. I have to be doing this thing mm -hmm. that feeds my soul and and you know drives my every breath. And um, you're right, uh, Leo. You hit it about the oversight, right? As an independent filmmaker, what you see is more or less my exact vision, right? And if I was working for a studio, that would not be the case. Yeah. Some some like studio boss would be telling me, you got to cut 10 minutes or this character doesn't make any sense, cut him out of the movie or, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and and yes, I have people in my retinue that, my, my especially my other producers, who have something to say about the creative the cut and, and whatnot but at the end of the day i'm the i singularly am making those final decisions i don't have somebody um hanging over my head saying you've got to cut 10 minutes out of this movie or this storyline doesn't make sense 
or I hate this scene, get rid of it, or whatever. Um, I, did somebody just mention Mississippi River Sharks? Yes. yes. Yep. Awesome. Santa Jaws, yes. Good times. Good times, 13th Wolfman. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, anyway. So uh, we do have the trailer. Would uh, Miles, would you like to uh, introduce it? Yeah, so... Um, Another thing that's really tricky about uh, making an independent film and, and trying to make it marketable uh, to a wide audience is making a trailer that really sort of captures the essence and the mood and the main storyline of the film without giving too much away. And um, Keith Leppard, our, our distributor, is on, on the last four films, and I we're always talking about that. You know, how many carrots do you give the audience without you know? blowing up the birthday cake so um uh we did our best that's that's what i'll say <laughs> Here, let's give it a look how are you feeling we got this mm -hmm. I got this. You know, these people at this party, they got Henrik Shepard's last three plays produced. All I need is the first one. <laughs> Come in. Make yourselves at home in the room to your right. If we impress these people, my play is headed straight for Broadway. This house is so weird. You don't look comfortable. I have to say, you have a one hell of a house here. How often do you have these dinners? These secret dinners. No one, no one knows we're here. Uh, in fact, um, they think we're on vacation. Let's eat. So I, I really think that uh, the 13th Wolfman who made that comment, I think this movie's right up his alley. Like I know what he likes and I think that he would dig this one. So Wolfie, because we also do reviews together and stuff like that. So Wolfie, we should do this one next. How about that? Yes, please. Yeah, we'll do this one. But um, Make that happen to Wolfie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I know, like you, you said, it's like a, it's you, know, you tried with the trailer, but the the one thing that um, I mean, I, I don't think it sold us anything that's not in the movie, you know. So that's one thing that we see a lot with a lot of the big budget stuff is I'll see a trailer like that looks amazing, and then I'll see the movie I'm like this is nothing like the trailer at all. Like, I don't know. So, so it, you know, it, it may not. It's it it doesn't mislead you. Yeah. I don't. Think. So I, I I think it's it's a good trailer. I mean. It's not like, you know, giving way too much away and stuff like that. But um, so yeah, it is streaming now on on Prime. Uh, it's not free on Prime. It's what is it like three ninety nine? I think to stream. Uh, yeah, I think so. It's it's also on iTunes. It's on Google Play. It's on Fandango now, Vudu, uh, YouTube, Premium, um, Cable VOD. Uh, if you're more of a physical media kind of guy like Tony. Yep. You can get yourself a Blu-ray or DVD on Amazon. Nice. Um, which, I, you know, I, I still love the physical media. Oh, yeah. You know, having that tactile thing, right? You're holding it in your hand. And the, the, the Blu-ray DVD also has a cool special feature. There's a, a BTS documentary uh, shot by a buddy of mine, a fellow filmmaker, Travis Mills. It's about a 10-minute BTS doc. Uh, we, he came to set... Uh, a couple of nights and uh, shot us shooting the movie and talks to all the cast members and there's some interesting insights and cool. I love that stuff. Yeah, that's yeah, the stuff that's 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 getting the physical media though. So yeah, mm. or a reason to grab that. Oh yeah, yeah, totally. What were you saying, Tony? No, I was saying for those of who I mean, I'm a big fan of uh, special features and this co uh, the uh, physical copy is is loaded with them. You know, nice. behind the scenes and all that stuff. For it, if if you're a physical media fan, you know I say definitely pick it up because nowadays too with streaming, you know it's easier, but then you don't get the the perks and the pluses of you know 
I mean, some is changing, like Voodoo, I think, is adding, you know, special features to their yeah. stuff. But if you're not getting the physical, uh, physical, you know, most of the time you're missing out on, yeah. you know, a lot of stuff. Right. Yeah, and there's two. There, uh, both the trailers are on the the Blu-ray DVD as well. The trailer you just saw, and then there was a an earlier teaser trailer that we did as well. Both the trailers are on there. Uh, no Wolfman. There is no commentary mm -hmm. on this one, unfortunately. Um, I, I I did a commentary one time uh, for my my third feature, Demons, which was so much fun to do, uh, and I wish I could do it every time, but it's. It's incredibly time consuming and it's a little bit costly because you have to have an engineer and um, and whatnot because you're effectively, you know, you're watching the movie and you're uh, you're recording this lengthy commentary, you know, the, the length of the film. And, and it, it really is a great thing. And, and I'm really proud of the one we did for Demons, which includes uh, Lin Lindsay Ann Williams and Jessica Harthcock, who played uh, a pivotal role in that film. So uh, and that is on the DVD of that film. But there's no commentary on this one. Uh, maybe on the uh, the re-release or the 10th anniversary or something. Because um, hmm. there really is a lot of a lot of cool stuff to talk about on this film, and I, I wish we had had time and had resources to do something like that. Well, you were talking about you know they allowed you to take over the house and you know throw blood everywhere because there's in this movie there's a lot. Like how much did you go through and like. Pretty much was everyone covered by the end of the, the <laughs> or whatever. Uh, gallons and gallons, yes. Everybody, everybody was covered at some point. Um, you know, and literally, Lindsay and I had to throw pillowcases away because we would come home from set and there'd be blood in our hair and you know all, all these kinds of things. Uh, but yeah, my makeup department head Dan Forrest said, you know, he's never seen so much blood on a movie set. And Allie Hart, God bless her. I mean, she couldn't leave set every night without showering. I, I can't tell you how many, how many, how many yellow dresses, Lindsay. Lindsay is over seven. So we went through seven yellow dresses. I feel like it was more, but um, yeah, those those yellow dresses were like you know paper towels. We just yeah. going through because <laughs> just in a box. And you get the next one. Box <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. So a lot of blood, a lot of blood. And it, it, I'm sorry. You know, in the in the in the uh, the pool fight, the pool hot tub fight with uh, Haley and Agatha. I mean, literally, we're pouring blood in that hot tub to give it that that red hue, right? And we're just pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring to get it uh, to the level we wanted. And, um, how do you clean that up? Like, how do you clean up uh, filling a hot tub with with blood? Like, I'm assuming it's still full. <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't know how you do. I don't know how you do it exactly. I, I leave that to the uh, the wizards in my uh, art department. Oh, nice. <laughs> Plenty of chlorine. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I have some chemicals. Yeah. I'm I mean, sure. a lot of uh, a lot of this blood is is water soluble. I mean, most of the blood that you actually put on an actor, right? It's it's water soluble. So when you when you have when you have a bleeding actor that you put in water. You have to have a different kind of blood, which is alcohol-based, which is much harder to get off. And so poor Allie, we really put her through the ringer because, you know, she's got the regular blood and then she's fighting in a pool and she's in water. And, and then when you put the alcohol blood that doesn't want to come off, I mean, you got to scrape that stuff off with like a, I don't know, a loofah and a, a fingernail brush or something. It's, it's really bad. You, so, you should have called them... You should have called in the, the doctors. I'm sure they have like a pool guy. Have them come in just to mess with them. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, geez. <laughs> just imagine that. Could you uh, yeah. check the pool, please? There's uh, something wrong with it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Any questions? <laughs> you point at the pool, then they just hear you peeling away in your in your car. Like, yeah, can you take care of this? Thanks. Um, so it, what about the – so the art department, were they were in charge of like the, the, the Alvagor or was it uh, – did you have someone special? Well, it was a combination of uh, – our, our production designer on the past couple of films, Julie Tosh, is she, – she really started as a uh, VFX makeup artist. Uh, and then she sort of worked her way up to becoming a department head. And it was really Julie and Dan Forrest, our makeup department head, who collaborated on all the gore and the wounds and the – all, all that and then and, and then it's we punch it up punch it all up a little bit in 
in post with, uh, with uh, our visual effects artists, uh, primarily Wesley O'Mary. Um, but yeah, the art, all of the, all of the food and the bloody, the, the guts and stuff that you see, that's, that was really Julie in the art department. Who was wow. for that. They did a fantastic job. Yeah, they did. It's, it's pretty mm -hmm. gross. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah, that the the garlic scene was oh my god, that was that was messed up. There was a <laughs> there was a lot of scenes that I was just like, okay, like we've seen everything, right? right. You know, watching so many movies, but it but keeps some going of up. this stuff. I was just like, oh, because you know it it you know starts off you know learning everything, and then it just takes off, and I'm like, okay, how they're gonna top that? Okay, they top that. Yeah, how they're yeah. gonna do this? Okay, they did that, and I was just like, wow, okay. And then, you know, the dinner scene is one thing. It's just like, wow, okay. Very yeah. intense. Well, thank you. Yeah. yeah. How would you, um, like, so for someone who is completely blind to this movie, um, how would you, like, what would you compare it to? Like, if someone was a fan of of something, like, even more recent, like, I, I mean, it's not like it at all, but I was thinking, like, even on a line of, like, Knives Out or, mm. like, even though well, it's with the house, I, I can see where you go. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I could, I could totally see that. I mean, it's got, um, it's got elements of some of the films that I thought about as we were sort of conceiving it were Eyes Wide Shut, mm -hmm. um, uh, Mother, mm -hmm. uh, which is a whacked out, crazy swing for the fences kind of film that you may absolutely hate, but at least Darren Aronofsky is going for it. Yeah. Um, uh, the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Okay. Um, because it 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 really it it's got a tongue in cheek kind of satirical element to it. Um, there are some things that I've seen since I made the movie that I've that I like. I I was one of the people who binge watched uh, Hannibal on Netflix when it came out on Netflix, mm -hmm. and so I see you know now I'm like, oh, <laughs> that's that's. That's really well done human cooking. So um, uh, it, it certainly has some, some elements of that. It's in the way it plays in sort of this sort of aria style, very operatic kind of vibe. Um, the Cook, the Thief, His Wife, and Her Lover. I mean, even like Titus Andronicus. I mean, there's a lot of stuff where human beings are getting eaten at, at some, to one degree or another um, that 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 this this film shares a sort of kindred with um but uh then with the, the cult part of it too though like because it's yeah it's got a little it's got that I, i'm just I'm, I'm trying to like have like a right blood myself. feast yeah people i work with so it's like we like well because we're all working from home now so it's like well we'll message each other and be like hey check this out or hey check this out oh what's it like what do we what would you compare it to so i'm just trying to figure out the best way to sell it um so yeah, that that's all. That's all. Yeah, I would I would say I would say it's it's um, it's sort of eyes wide shut meets uh, the cook, the thief, his wife, and her lover meets Hannibal meets the Rocky Horror Picture Show, um, with a kind of uh, Rosemary's Baby cultic edge to it. Or something, yeah, something along that line. Especially the the end. It's not like a twist twist ending, but I was like. Okay, that's definitely different. I didn't see that coming from you know from it. And I'm like, oh, that's you know very creative. I've got you know we there's certain movies. Well, me watching movies all the time, I kind of try to guess in the middle, which is like a detriment to myself because <laughs> instead of trying to enjoy the movie as much, I'm trying to be like, okay, well, there's probably like ten different ways this thing can go. Okay, it's getting closer to this one, so I'll take this. But the end, I'm like, oh, okay, did not see that coming. Well, that means a lot, Tony. I, I appreciate that. I, I like to I like to catch the audience off guard. Um, hopefully, having planted some seeds, where like if you were to go back and watch the movie again, you might go, oh, "Okay, that makes sense now." And I, I think a lot of the good twisty movies have that quality in them, where it's sort of it's it's just subtly there, um, but it doesn't beat you over the head. And if you like the twist in Fight Club or something like that, you go, you know. The first time you see it, you're like, holy shit. Yeah. But then when you go back and watch the movie again, you're like, okay, I, yeah. And it was obvious the whole time. Right. He, right. He had planted the seeds. The whole <laughs> Same thing with like the sixth sense and all that stuff. Right. It's like, oh, obviously. Yeah. Right. Well, um, uh, but, 
but you know the twist was so much fun for me and that was that was in t- uh, the twist was entirely uh uh my creation and i just thought i mean once we got into sort of the character of sadie and who she was and and what she was about it, it just it, it almost i don't know it almost wrote itself uh, hmm. really and um and that's one of the what, what the exciting thing about this creative process writing with mike horn my co-writer on this is you know we just started started going back and forth and 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 things started pouring out and and then uh that ending just sort of was made manifest and and we both knew that's how it had to go thanks well uh speaking of movie twists oh. you know, uh Wait, I don't, I don't this yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't need to twist your arm to tell you about uh, Deadly Grounds Coffee. Yuck. <laughs> that could have been so much better. Yeah. Hey, is what I do. Uh, anyway, you know, if you want to, now more than ever, we need to support local businesses. Uh, Deadly Grounds Coffee, they're a local roaster right here in Connecticut. Uh, matter of fact, uh, the uh, husband and wife team that run it, uh, they're away on their honeymoon right now, but they'll be back. Actually, I think they're coming back this week. Uh, but they make the actual best coffee you'll ever have. Uh, Death by Chocolate is my favorite. Uh, Kevin, what's your favorite? I'm still I'm still rocking the uh, Hell's Fury oh. and the Maple Walnut oh. together. Oh, uh, I'm almost out though, so I'm gonna like. I'm glad he's coming back from his uh, honeymoon because I'm gonna have to order again soon. Yeah, I know. I'm almost out of chocolate. I need to. You order had 19 it. bags. How? Yeah. Oh. No, no, out of chocolate. I got like two bags of chocolate left. I have plenty of chocolate, uh, raspberry, and uh, so, so pumpkin. Clear the ad, and then <laughs> here we go. Here, here's a psychiatrist or something. I don't know. <laughs> Everyone thinks because you're a zombie, you don't know good coffee. Well, they're wrong. There's only one brew that gets my seal of approval. Deadly Grounds Coffee is my guilty pleasure. The aroma is so intoxicating. It brings all of my neighbors out of the woodwork. Deadly Grounds Coffee. Coffee to die for and zombie approved. It's good to get a little deadly. Use the front door! Oh, they're so disgusting. And my problem is, uh, since we're all working from home now, uh, well, not I, all, I, I hear you. I, I'm in the same boat. I was, my coffee was lasting a lot longer because I used to be able to drink coffee for free at work, and now I have to make it at home. So yeah, well, I mean, I would make like two travel mugs to bring to work. Now I'm drinking two pots a day. Uh, Miles, uh, we do have a question from Wolfie asking, uh, who are your biggest influences in either acting or writing? Oh man, that's tough. Um, I guess I would say um, my favorite my favorite film actor is Daniel Day Lewis. Um, I, I love the way he brings sort of a theater actor sensibility to film, um, and as a result, uh, all of his performances are a little bit theatrical, but they work perfectly in the world uh, of the character that is being that he is creating. Um, whether that's, you know, Bill the Butcher in uh, Gangs of New York or Abraham Lincoln. Um, I, I mean, I, I just think he's, he's in, or Daniel Plainview and There Will Be Blood. I just think he's an exquisite, exquisite uh, performer. Um, so he's a big one for me. In terms of writing, um, I mentioned a couple of them uh, earlier. Uh, Tennessee Williams. Um uh, Eugene O'Neill, William Shakespeare uh, has been a huge influence on on my uh, creative life uh, almost since I cared about plays at all. I was reading Julius Caesar in the I don't know ninth or tenth grade, and 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 haven't stopped thinking about Shakespeare at some level uh, ever since. Um, in terms of what I'm doing of late, I, I'm thinking a lot about the the great horror films of the 1970s, uh, like The Exorcist uh, and The Omen and and Rosemary's Baby. We we mentioned a little earlier, um, and how those films really built character uh, a, as much as they built shortness of breath, and you know and um, I mean, The Exorcist in particular, I've been thinking a lot about uh, of late and, and, you know, 
how much time that film spends building the character of, of Damien Karras and his relationship with his mother and before it pulls the rug out from under you. And uh, it's just, it's just really, really an incredible film on so many different levels. Uh, uh, Jaws, it was a huge film for me, um, which is a script by Carl Gottlieb and, and Peter Benchley and Richard Dreyfuss and Roy Scheider and uh, Robert Shaw, right? And uh, the Alien script uh, written by Dan O'Bannon. Um, of course, that film directed by Ridley Scott. You, you know, just in terms of uh, Michael Mann, uh, is a has been a big influence on me. I mean, I could really just go on and on and talk about this stuff forever, but uh, that, to name a few, there there you go, Wolfie. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's a very good, uh, very good. I, I agree with you on on pretty much all of that. Like Daniel Day Lewis, I almost hold him in a different level. Yeah, like, he really is like, like, like a different actor. Sport, it's, like, I almost never think of him because I'm like he's he's de he's he's Daniel Day Lewis, and then there's actors. Like it's it's weird, <laughs> like, you know, but um. It's it's weird, and then yeah, like I agree with you 100 percent too about like the 70s horror, just 70s movies in general. Like I I tend you, you always care more about those. Like I think that might be why I like a lot of independent stuff too. Is I think that it, it it's almost has that vibe because there's more character development because they need to, you know. Yeah, it's one of those things where like you would say in the Omen and the Exorcist and stuff, mm -hmm. like they didn't really you know rely on you know special effects or you know like that, visuals. Yeah. It's all you know character development and mm -hmm. getting the people scared before the like story. yeah the story like, it's it's just crazy how there's some movies from like the 70s and 80s which had no you know budgets or or special effects that scare me more than these movies that have you know 10 million dollar budgets that are right. supposed to scare you and i look and i laugh it's like it just shows you like you don't need i mean some oh. special effects work but you don't need it Hmm. Yeah. But. I mean, The Exorcist is still terrifying. I just, I showed it in my directing class this past semester at Loyola, and we watched it in the screening room on the big screen before we were shut down. It is utterly terrifying today. Hmm. Right. And that film, you know, is 40, 50, going on 50 years old. Right. I mean, it's, it's utterly shocking and terrifying right now and i think it has to do with the fact that why does it succeed so well as a horror film because it succeeds as a character drama hmm. really, i mean you know who these people are ellen burston's character and and jason miller's character and, um and even max von Sydow. i mean the whole prologue in iraq right sets up the whole movie yeah but if that's in a studio movie today, I guarantee you some asshole <laughs> studio head is going to say, what the hell is this doing in our movie? Get rid of it. We don't need like, it. You said a rock. I thought you meant we're going to put the rock in it. And it's gonna, <laughs> I thought you meant <laughs> it's going to sell a million, you know, a million tickets. But, um, but yeah, and I, uh, I'm jealous because I, I wish that I could take your class because I would love to watch. If I could watch The Exorcist in school, you kidding me? I would have done something. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, that's cool. That's that's pretty awesome. Leo, you were trying to say something? Yeah, uh, so we got a question. I'm going to try to decipher this. I believe this has come from Sergio. So, uh, Miles, what's a uh, what's a horror movie that like really scared the crap out of you? Besides The Exorcist, I guess. Besides The oh, Exorcist. Okay, besides The Exorcist. Um, I mean, when I was a kid, I mean, I got I have to go back to Jaws. I mean, it, it the scariest thing I had ever seen was the that underwater shark POV. I mean, it was like, uh, you know, I think I saw that film for the first time when I was probably uh, seven or eight years old in the, you know, early 80s, came out in, I think, 75. Um, and, you know, I, would, I snuck on HBO one night and watched it, right? And, you know, for about a month, I was afraid to go in the swimming pool. I mean, it was, that sharp POV was, absolutely terrifying alien is another film that's absolutely terrifying what both of those films do extremely well is they they understand the power of uh, the, the anxiety of not seeing the creature right of not seeing the thing which is infinitely more terrifying than actually seeing the thing 
and and Jaws and Alien are probably, I mean, maybe the the two best all time examples of not showing you the creature, right? But still creating like this sense of like fear and dread. Right. Exactly. So so incredibly powerful. You know, I saw other things that sort of disturbed me, like. Um, the Seventh Sign was a movie that disturbed me growing up. Hellraiser. Um, but Jaws and Alien, in terms of, you know, out, out excluding The Exorcist, in terms of just the fear factor, the utter terror of, I would see that underwater shark POV and I would be like, oh my. I, I would have to avert my eyes. It was absolutely <laughs> horrifying. That, that yeah. affected people for years and years and years. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. affected you too. Uh, Oh yeah, it, it, that that movie scared the shit out of me, and even to this day, even swimming in a lake, I, I you know I still it, back in my head. I'm thinking, oh shit, Jaws. Yeah. Is uh, we were at a lake on the first <laughs> of July, and I was just like, is there lake sharks here? Like, yeah. what, what's the deal? Like that, right away, the first thing I thought was a shark. You know, yeah. and I'm on well, a lake. They have that picture of the Jaws on the big screen and people in tubes in the water, mm. and like. Well, how much would you have to get paid to do that kind of deal? Oh, yeah. You talk about pools. I, when I was younger, the same thing. It's like I'm in a swimming pool. Like, why am I worried about like a shark coming after me? It's like one of those. You're in the bathtub. You're just like, yeah. Oh. You're on the toilet. Yeah. <laughs> toilet sharks. And I mean, they pointed out right in the movie that's like most most shark attacks happen in three feet of water or something like that. And mm. so even you know you'd be standing up in the shallow end and you're like. I'm I'm about to lose a leg. Yeah, I mean, it's just like terrifying. Yep, I agree. Leo, we're actually getting close to the end there. I don't know if we oh, should wow. Be again, yeah, time flies. Totally, uh, Miles. It was awesome having you on again. You know, it's just uh, you, you do awesome work. And so, for people looking to uh, to find uh, the dinner party, uh, what's the best place to send them? So uh, the dinner party is on Amazon, it's on iTunes, it's on Google Play, it's on Fandango Now, it's on Vudu, it's on YouTube, it's on cable VOD. You can purchase a Blu-ray or DVD on Amazon. Um, and uh, the only thing I ask is, you know, if you watch the movie and you have anything nice to say about it at all, uh, go on the platform where you watch the movie and leave us a user review. Or go on IMDb and leave us a user review because... Independent films really do succeed by virtue of word of mouth. It's fans who, who, uh, you know, they watch the film, they digest it, they, they love what they see, and then they tell people about it, and they get on social media, or they get on these various platforms, and they talk about the film. That's how independent films really catch fire, and that's what allows us uh, to keep doing what we do. So um, I would really, really appreciate it if uh, – Folks watching this who watch our movie, go on one of these platforms and say something nice about our film. If you hated our film, then just don't say anything at all. That'd be fine too, um, because the world has enough haters and trolls. Yep. So, um, but if you if you have anything nice to say about the film, uh, leave it in some public forum. That would mean a lot to us. Which but, sounds like some of the you know critics nowadays, where everybody just has. You know, oh, I didn't like the movie. Why didn't you like the movie? Oh, because it was horrible. Why was it horrible? Oh, because it was like, bad. Yeah. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for it. Because it was the worst movie ever. <laughs> like, oh, thank you for your insight. Uh, every, every, yeah. time, every time I release a movie, I get a I get a user review somewhere that's like, this is the worst movie ever. And I'm like, ever? Yeah. <laughs> like, like the worst movie? That's a bold statement. <laughs> I mean, when you really consider all the movies that were ever made, and this is the worst movie ever? I want to see what's in their collection. I just want to see what they, what they love. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you have know, like Freddy got fingered poster on the wall or something like that. You're just like, okay, <laughs> your opinion matters. Let's go. Twilight or you know, Fifty Shades yeah. of Grey or something like hey, that. I, my wife likes those things. And the, the problem, my, my problem is, it, it seems like there's more cruelty toward independent films than toward studio films, the the last Jedi notwithstanding. But like it, as a general rule, these these people are much meaner to indie filmmakers than they are to the big studio films that have all this money. And, and I'm wondering if they're just holding us to a different standard or I don't I don't know. It's it's but I, I'm always baffled by the hate 
that well, it I think, generates. I think what it is is that like with the big budget stuff, like everyone wants to jump on the same bus, the same bandwagon. And just like with retail and with like many other things out there, the only people that are going to say anything are the people that are going to complain. Right. Like it's very tough like to get like a good customer service review, but it's very yeah. easy to get a bad one, you know? 100%. Yeah. I'm not saying though, but uh, I mean, I never, even when I started reviewing and stuff, I never bashed any movie, but I think this podcast really opened my eyes because I don't think everybody knows, you know, what goes into making movies you know, when I first started, I was young and naive, I guess, if it would be the right word. But, you know, having talked to so many directors and people in the indie industry, I never knew, you know, you only have a certain amount of days to shoot this. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, it gets cut because of weather and stuff. Yeah. I never looked at, at a movie in that light, in that perspective. So I was, I'm not as bad as, you know, or wasn't as bad as some of these critics like i said but mm -hmm. not everybody knows what goes into especially you know with indie movies you have a limited budget you have a limited time and then so many things could and then you put out you know the what you can so i look at movies 10 times different than i ever did doing this podcast mm -hmm. i think everyone should you know sit down and listen and be like hey listen i see this movie here it might be not you know have the greatest look or you know the greatest acting or this or that but that you don't know what went behind that that so many people are missing so you're absolutely right i mean tony independent filmmakers move mountains um i mean they they bleed and die to get these films made mm -hmm. i mean the the obstacles that that are required uh to overcome that we have to overcome to make these films are, are really, you know, incredible because we can't buy our way out of problems. We have to find creative solutions to those problems. Uh, we can't buy ourselves more time. If we're out of time, the scene's not in the movie. <clears throat> you know, I mean, that's just what it boils down to. And I think you're absolutely right. I, I think a lot of folks just don't realize how hard it is uh, to get a film made of any quality and then get it out in the world. It's, right. it's a really, really hard thing, certainly when you're on a budget like so many of us independent filmmakers are. Yeah, because even with the bigger budget movies, it's hard enough. Just yeah. imagine it's 10 times harder with the limited resources and limited budget and stuff like that. I mean, just anything nowadays is, is unless you're doing it, I guess you don't I know. I mean, hopefully people are. We, we, we hear about it, so we that's how we know. Like yeah. I, I'm like I've always said I've I've said it a billion times I'll say it again. Um, like it, it's you know if it, if there's a movie that I don't like it's still a hundred times better than any movie I've ever made because I've never made a movie. So they went through and they got the movie made. They actually, you know, they were able to do it. They've succeeded more than I've been able to do. So kudos to that alone. You know, one hundred percent, Kevin. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. Uh, there was uh, what was it? Four twenty massacre where their footage uh, actually got stolen. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like there was a home invasion and like all of their like uh, the full cut of the movie was was taken. Yeah, they, they finished editing and uh, luckily they had raw files left and they had to re edit the whole movie again. Oh and, man. Yeah. Nightmare. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but anyways, it's that time, Leo. It is. Okay. So uh, you know, if you want to follow Miles or uh any of our awesome uh guests here, check the show notes down below or up above, depending on where you're watching or listening to us. You'll find all the links there, but uh, head on over to the dorkening.com for all the shows on the network, including this one. And uh so Miles, where do you like people uh following you on social media? Uh primarily Instagram and Twitter. So I'm uh on both those sites at, at Miles underscore Doliac. That's at Miles underscore Doliac. M I L E S underscore D as in dog O L E A C. Uh, you can check out our website at Historia Films M S H I S T O R I A Films M S dot com, uh, which has all our films and a bit about our company and our philosophy and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, the dinner party has a Facebook page as well, uh, where you can check out reviews and articles and latest news and all that kind of stuff. And of course you can find the movie on IMDb and read the critics reviews and the user reviews, good, bad, and indifferent, and hopefully leave one yourself. So yeah, yeah awesome. please do, please do uh, check us out. 
And uh, people can see you next in Lovecraft Country, you said? Uh, Lovecraft Country, yes. I think I'm in episode three of the of that first season coming out. Nice. Very cool. Do you know what's what is it going to be on? What platform? I think it's on HBO. Oh, okay. Oh. I think it's on HBO. It's pretty. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's look. That's going to be a that's going to be a tremendous show and 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 fantastically timely. I mean, I mean, Jordan Peele, right? He just has his finger on the pulse of what's what's going on culturally. Yeah. He's just. I mean, the guy is brilliant. Right. Um, and Misha Misha Green, uh, who is, who is really you know right there. I mean, she's she's on set, you know, driving the train. Um, so that's going to be a really special show. I think I encourage people to watch it. Nice. Yeah, definitely. Uh, looks like it comes out August sixteenth on HBO. Yeah. Okay. Right. There we go. Tony. Uh, you can find me on Tony Has Nine Fingers on YouTube, where I do movie reviews and unboxings and whatsoever uh tony has nine fingers on twitter tony's movies on instagram where i show off uh the movies behind me and of course here every tuesday night on the wicked horror show yo yo um boy meets phone on twitter instagram facebook and youtube yo saint laurent on those same social media channels and of course you can find me here kevin a knuckle on twitter and instagram every tuesday night here on the wicked horror show i'm also doing reviews with the 13th wolfman over on the audio side um, I'm also part of Secret Underground Hideout and Black and White Fright, all of which are on the network. Leo. Yeah, for me, just Google Leo Pond. you find a bunch of stuff. Could be true, could be not. I'm not going to say which is which. Uh, but more importantly, uh, check out uh, Miles and his awesome work here and also everybody on the show here. And The Dorkening. You know, the show is powered by The Dorkening Power, uh, Podcast Network. Head on over to thedorkening.com. And uh, I think that's about it. And Deadly Grounds, go buy some coffee. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Bye, guys. See you.